Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Although the media and, frankly, creators like myself have remained completely focused on all the drama surrounding Starship, the FAA, etc., quietly an organization, a small company, although led by a pretty powerful multi-billionaire, is on their way to deploying the first commercial space station. And although we have many companies who claim that they're about to do this, This particular company is making a lot of tangible progress, and actually they don't require any new type of launch provider, any new type of rocket to deploy the beginnings of their space station. As a matter of fact, a fully human-rated station could be launched by a SpaceX Falcon 9 before the end of next year, and I think this deserves a lot more attention than it's currently getting. So that's what we're going to be doing here on The Angry Astronaut right now. Space, as we all know, is a wretched place for human beings. The only practical solution to putting humans into orbit on other planets or any place else in the solar system is to bring pieces of our own planet with us. On the International Space Station, this has been done with limited degrees of success. The ISS is an extremely utilitarian space station. It doesn't have a whole lot of creature comforts, nor does it have a a great deal on board to remind us of where we came from, aside from the cupola that gives astronauts a view of our magnificent Earth below. Vast appears to be going in a different direction, as are most private companies who are designing replacements for the International Space Station. But one of the key differences with Vast, at least for their long-term plans, is the development of artificial gravity. There are a few companies that are talking about artificial gravity with low Earth orbit space stations, but VAST has a roadmap to accomplish all of this. And that, in my opinion, is one of the best solutions that you can come up with when we're talking about balancing the utility of outer space and the practicality of putting human beings there in the long term. What am I talking about? Well, if you're a company building a space station and you want to make money with it, putting gravity on the station is one of the worst things you can possibly do. And this is because the microgravity environment, the unique nature of this environment makes certain types of industrial and especially medical applications possible. And if you introduce gravity into that equation, all of those solutions go away. This includes 3D printing new types of materials, metals, and also 3D printing organs and new types of medicines. Currently, if you try to 3D print any type of biological material here on Earth, that material ends up in a useless puddle at the bottom of a Petri dish. Not so in microgravity, but if you introduce even a little bit of gravity, like say one-sixth gravity as exists on the moon, then all of the biological material is still going to end up in a puddle at the bottom of your petri dish. You need to have microgravity in order to be able to create so many of the unique things that can be made in space. But of course, the problem is if you have microgravity on your space station, your human beings on board begin to really suffer in terms of bone loss, in terms of muscle loss, and many other medical problems, some of which never go away. And this is why I oftentimes don't take space stations like this one from Orbital Assembly very seriously. Even though this rotating environment will provide artificial gravity for the inhabitants, there's actually nothing at the center of this station where microgravity exists and where all of the valuable work and the valuable 3D printing and other activities that make the space station a good economic idea in the first place can happen, which means 
stations, these types of space stations are only useful for human habitation and virtually nothing else, which of course is not very economically viable. The only way this space station concept makes any kind of sense at all is if you have it orbiting in close proximity to a microgravity space station where you have your money-making opportunities going on and all of your workers, all of your human components living on the orbital station and then transferring back and forth between the two. But VAST has a different approach to all of this and in my opinion, a pretty damn good one. But let's go ahead and follow their roadmap to one of these artificial gravity types of stations next year if everything goes well and these guys are showing a great deal of tangible progress in their videos vast intends to put up a demonstrator station simply known as haven demo this is in space tested for qualified hardware and software that will support crew on a station called haven one which will be the first human rated station that vast puts out and probably the first human rated commercial station that will ever be placed in orbit and it supports development of robust space flight and team operations and of course, we move on to Haven 1, which I've already mentioned, a tiny space station module. I mean, that's pretty much all this thing amounts to because it has to fit inside the fairing of a Falcon 9. Vast is not waiting on the development of Starship to get this thing into service. They're moving forward with a human rated station now. And if Haven 1 is indeed deployed as planned with a crew of four on board, it will be the world's first commercial space station. Station, a single module station, as I said before, supporting both crew and payloads and provides both microgravity and lunar artificial gravity environments, interestingly enough. I don't know how much of that I'd buy. I'd really like to see some more specifics on that. You'd have to make this thing rotate insanely fast in order to get any gravity whatsoever. And again, I question whether or not that type of environment is really all that good for a small space station anyway if you want to make money. Then we step up to the Starship class module. This is a seven meter diameter module. By the way, really good idea in my opinion because that could also theoretically be deployed by New Glenn and it provides a huge potential for in-space activity including artificial gravity environments. Again, I think that's possible with something this big. And then finally we move on to the enormous or vast artificial gravity stations 100 meters long a spinning stick station comprising of seven individually launched starship glass modules that provide earth venus mars moon and microgravity environments genius. And why do I think it's genius? Well, it's because we really don't know what sort of effect reduced gravity is going to have on human beings. We know what microgravity does, but we have no clue as to what reduced gravity is going to do to human health, human development, etc. And that will really tell us whether or not colonizing other planets is going to be practical in the future. And a spinning stick space station will have increasing amounts of gravity depending on how far away your module is to the end of the stick. The center area of the station will be in microgravity. Then the next modules out will probably be in varying amounts of lunar to Martian gravity. And then when you get out to the end, you reach Earth and Venus gravity, which are practically identical. So a very good idea, an excellent design that makes use of both the commercial advantages of outer space and provides a livable habitat for human beings where maybe, just maybe, we won't suffer quite as much in the long term while on long deployments in space. So just for the sake of comparison, let's go ahead and compare all of these vast space stations to the space stations that have been deployed in the past. We start out with the first 
human-rated space station ever deployed, the Soviet Salyut 1, with a hundred cubic meters worth of pressurized volume. This is a little misleading. Pressurized volume is not the same as habitable volume because you need to have some of that volume dedicated to equipment, life support, that sort of thing. A hundred cubic meters of pressurized volume. Salyut 1 was tiny, as were most of the Salyut space stations. Then we have Skylab, 352 cubic meters worth of pressurized space launched by the colossal Saturn V rockets, followed up by the Mir space station with 350 cubic meters. And then we start stepping up to the big boys, the ISS with over a thousand cubic meters of pressurized space not habitable space keep in mind that's less than 500 cubic meters a thousand cubic meters of pressurized space and then the chinese tiangong which is currently 340 cubic meters but is probably going to get a lot bigger as time goes on now let's make some comparisons with the vast ideas first of all we have the tiny demonstration station that should be going up next year and it has no habitable volume it's just for technology Technology demonstration followed up by Haven 1 which is going to be a tiny space station 80 cubic meters worth of pressurized space once again I'm thinking that this is pressurized not habitable if we're comparing apples to apples make it an even a little bit smaller than the Salyut space stations followed up by the Starship class modules with 500 cubic meters with a pressurized volume so if you get two of these that's the equivalent of the entire fair of Starship, and then you bump up to the big daddies of the space station world, bigger than any station that has ever been deployed, and that's the Artificial Gravity Station with over 3,500 cubic meters worth of pressurized space. It theoretically has a crew of eight, but honestly, in my opinion, you could probably put a lot more people on this thing. Even if you're dedicating half of that pressurized space to equipment and such, that means you're still looking at 1,750 cubic meters meters worth of habitable volume if you dedicate 19 cubic meters to each human being which is what nasa recommends you could fit 92 people on this station fairly comfortably actually now of course you probably wouldn't get a hell of a lot of work done you need a lot more space dedicated to laboratories that sort of thing plus i also expect that some of the station is going to be used for hotels in other words temporary residents so that may be why a crew of eight is recommended here and also not all of the station is going to be in the right kind of gravity for some inhabitants, so that could be part of the issue as well, but still, it's utterly colossal. We're talking the types of stations that could eventually be expanded out to build towns in space or even cities it is a very exciting prospect and it's very interesting to note that vast is receiving all of their funding from their founder who by the way is a multi-billionaire named jed mccaleb this is very promising as well they've done all of this without any nasa funding without any taxpayer money whatsoever as opposed to their competitors who have definitely received nasa awards Right now, it appears that VAST is in a position to deploy their space stations before any of their competitors will. Axiom Space, who received over $100 million from NASA, is in a world of hurt right now financially and may never deploy their station at all. And Sierra Space, as promising as their inflatable modules are, they were supposed to do their space station in conjunction with Blue Origin, and we haven't seen a whole lot of new information about that and although I'm confident that Sierra Space can go it alone and deploy their inflatable modules which have enormous amounts of habitable space I really think that that is a very good solution for the future but still I don't think they're going to get those deployed as rapidly as 
as Vast seems to be in a position to do, which means if Vast gets the jump on everybody else, if they demonstrate the commercial practicality of a space station before any of their competitors do, they are well positioned to get a whole lot of investment and a whole lot of customers ahead of everyone else and deploy the first viable replacement for the International Space Station exactly when we're going to need it. I can't wait to see what they've got coming next. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and also please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal because I am here in Milan now. I'm going to be bringing you some incredible information not only about this space station but other technologies as well. If you want to support what I'm doing over here, again, Again, all the details in the description. Thanks again for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.